We are ready. Go ahead, Ray Zimmerman. All right. Uh, first, introduce Finn Billing. Finn has been a member of the Chattanooga Writers Guild since it started in 2001. As his Danish friends and family know, he attended high school in Copenhagen, studied at the University of Copenhagen, and served in the Royal Danish Navy. For many years in the summer term, he taught English at the International People's College in Elsinore. While Finn and Jeannie lived in Atlanta, he studied at Georgia State University, earning a master's and doctoral degree in English. Finn is an active public poet in Chattanooga, reading at public events and participating in the activity. Finn's other books of poetry are Waking Dreams, Rights of the Earth, and Fire Poems. His books were included in the anthology Southern Light, 12 Contemporary Southern Poets. Since 2015, he's published in the Bridge Journal of the Danish American Heritage Society, edited by Julie Allen. These poems are included in the King's Coin. He will read from and discuss poems in the 2020 edition. Thank you. Please welcome Finn Billy. And uh, this is where I do most of my writing. And I'm now going to read you the title poem from the book. And the title poem is entitled The King's Coin. Uh, if I can figure out how to do this. Here we go. No, that's the little mermaid. I want the, uh, hold on. There we go. Does everybody see it? Yeah, you can nod. Okay. <clears throat> okay, the king's coin. In memory of Christian the 10th, king of Denmark, 1912 to 1947. I know I promised to keep King Christian safe on my, in my pocket on his Danish coin. But I lost it on the Greyhound bus between Chicago and LA. I've gone back to Copenhagen between Castle and Canal where I, then five years old, had held the flag and mother's hand as his empty saddled horse rang steel on granite cobblestone. The coin shop clerk ransacked his drawers until he found King Christian's corner, apologized for smooth out edges, the king defaced and pocket worn. He did not understand when I said, perfect. <laughs> so, so there you go. Uh, Somebody asked me, did you really lose a coin on the ground bus between Chicago and, and LA? And I said, no, I didn't, but this is a poem. And uh, so I made it up for its symbolic significance of going west in the United States and taking my Danish heritage in the form of a coin with me. And so I lost it, which means that there's a certain loss of one's national identity, you know, when immigrating. And that's what I was trying to say. So uh, uh, that, uh, the, I did buy the coin, by the way, at a shop in Copenhagen, but uh, okay. So that's, do I have any, any questions about this poem from anybody? And, and I, I'm, I just I was typing into the chat that was very cool I love that symbolism of like the coin traveling who, who just spoke Kelly oh Kelly hi Kelly yeah good thank you any any questions about it or comments you you'll have to unmute yourself to ask the question or you can type it in Okay, so uh, this, uh, unlike, <laughs> so therefore Thank you're you. saying it was so clear that you, <laughs> there's no way you can ask any questions, but well, that's unusual no. for poetry in general. <laughs> so, <laughs> Well, Ben, this is Sandra. I do have a question. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. Okay. 
Uh, could you say more about the image being worn and the shopkeeper apologizing for it? Oh yeah, so, so you know how coin collectors and coin shop owners set a very high premium on, on the condition of coins. They're supposed to be perfect. And uh, uh, I am not a perfectionist and I'm an imperfectionist. And not only that, but the, Dan the coin representing the, my Danish background and heritage, of course, is tarnished and, and pocket worn. Uh, and uh, that's the symbolism of that. And so I yeah. said, that's perfect. It, it's supposed to be. Okay. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, it does. All right. Anybody else? Okay. Helga, you're screen sharing again, please. There you go, thanks. Okay, I'm going to screen share this introduction for Helga. Helga Kidder is a native of Germany's Black Forest and lives in the Tennessee Hills with her husband. She was awarded an MFA from Vermont College and is co-founder of the Chattanooga's Guild, leading their poetry. Her poems have been published in numerous journals and anthologies. She has received a nomination for a pushcart. She has participated in workshops in the United States and abroad. She is the author of four collections of poetry, Wild Plums, Luckier Than the Stars, Blackberry Winter, and Loving the Dead, which won the Blue Light Press Book Award in 2020. She has completed another collection of poems, Learning Curve, dealing with transference from one language to another. The collection is slated for publication in late 2021. Uh, do you have a poem for us, Helga? I do, I do. And um, it's one of my favorites in my book, um, Loving the Dead. And um, I don't think it needs any introductions. If you have questions afterwards, that'll be fine. The poem is called Praise. After snow and freeze, a lone jonquil flares, a bright light at the wood's edge, the moon's fullness fading, a witness. You finally grown into yourself, mapped out your own paradise, the yoke you chose early, nightly dreams stiffening your backbone, lining your tongue with soft words. You must be a minor God, creating with your hands and body little miracles that drizzled your years with sweetness. Gusts push a bank of clouds over the ridge, darkening the day. You must turn on your own light. Okay, I'm open for questions. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I am not sharing the poem on the screen, so it's difficult to, um, to see the words. And um, so I'll toss out a question, Helga. We've yes. talked about your book before, but uh, tell us a little of the background and the meaning of the title, Loving the Dead. Can okay. You uh, yes, Loving the Dead came to me after my sister died, and she was my older sister, I, but I only have one sister, so um, it, it was a difficult time for me, and I realized that we need to love the dead because uh, they have to stay in our memory, we have to remember all the stories and other things that we remember about them. Oh. All right. So that particular poem, what was the, is there anything else you wanna say about the inner context of that poem? Um, 
I think it's a reflection on really on my life um, that I figured all the things that we have done in our lives created, you know, um, making friends, having a good relationship with the, with your husband, um, all these things and raising children um, that to create with your hands and body, those times, uh, they seem now looking back like little miracles. And uh, so I figured I must be a minor God, <laughs> having uh, had that good. kind of power. <laughs> so it was asked in the, uh, in the chat where, it was asked about both of you where your books are available. Uh, it was published by, yours was Blue Light Press. Blue Light correct? Press, but it's available on Amazon. So we go to Amazon and type in, search for Helga Kidder. We get Absolutely. your author page and your other yeah. books are on there as well. Yes, exactly. Okay. And uh, I suppose we Three could also- Three of your books were from Blue Light Press. Uh, except the first one, Wild Plums, was Finishing yeah. Line Press. Okay. Ray, what's on next on the agenda? And what's no the availability? Well, I'm going to have Finn tell us the availability of his book, where okay. we can get it. All right. Are you ready? Do you hear me? Do you all hear me? Yes. Okay, here we go. All right, well, my book was published here in Chattanooga and uh, by uh, uh, the local press. <clears throat> and it's available in print at the at the Winder Binder Bookstore on Fraser Avenue. And it is sold also at the Museum of Danish America in Elkhorn, Iowa. So you can order it from there. In fact, Klaus, who's on, who's here in the meeting, did that. And, it, and uh, uh, I, I appreciate that. Uh, it's, uh, let's see, what else? It is not on Amazon. However, it is on my website. The whole book is on my website and you can download it for free. And so this is a way of giving it away. I am much more concerned with people reading my poetry than with uh, making a little bit of money on it. <clears throat> so what is your website? Finn How do we Billy finbilly.com f i n n b i l l e dot com okay well that should be easy enough to yeah. find yeah he put a link in the chat say what okay. i said you put a link in the chat that people can go to yeah oh yeah that's right okay i understand now all right, what's next? I have, a, I have a question for both Finn and Helga. This is Jim Gibson, I'm a friend of Finn's. Hey, I Jim. Don't know Helga. You, you are both uh, people who came to the US from other cultures, other countries, and you have another language. And I'm wondering how having dual languages and maybe a, a kind of a dual way of looking at things might impact the way you see things and the way you write poetry, if at all, maybe, maybe not at all, maybe a whole lot. I'm just curious how the, how the duality uh, works. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's a very good question, Jim. And there's Sandra. Yeah. Hi. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, <clears throat> we're going to discuss the question of languages uh, as part of the agenda for today. So maybe, uh, Ray, do you think we should uh, postpone the answer till we get to that? Yeah. Ray? Where's Ray? He's muted. I was yeah, muted I because to, yeah. I can't hear a thing if I'm, well, if I'm unmuted. I can't okay. hear the rest of the thing at all because so I'm question, on a secondary connection. So <laughs> okay. make, make, make sense to me for you to put it off. I didn't realize it was coming yeah. up later. Okay. 
All right, that's what we'll do. Thank you for the questions. Very good okay. question. I, want, I wanted to ask you both about the sections of your book, first Helga and then Finn. I know Helga's got a book that's in three sections and four, four sections in Finn's book. Tell us uh, what that's about. What, what do each of those sections mean? Okay, you're asking me? Yes. Um, okay, the first section, I have three sections, which are divided by... Um, haiku each section, but uh, the first section deals with um, the small deaths that we all experience in a lifetime through giving up, giving in, change of attitude. The second section deals entirely with my sister's death and the loss I felt. And the third section um, includes all of the lives that were lost either in war, in accidents, or through neglect. Oh, very good. Okay. Ray, yeah. are you... <laughs> Go ahead, Finn. Okay, well... <clears throat> My book, uh, The King's Coin, Danish American Poems, has uh, uh, four sections, but actually it has an introductory section as well. Uh, and, we, and we don't have the content, the table of contents, which we could have had, but we don't. Uh, so first, I uh, translate uh, a, a, a verse of my grandmother's song about the island where she lives, which is called Mern. And then I uh, quote uh, from uh, Knut Rasmussen's uh, statue on the, on, the, on the coast north of Denmark. And, uh, uh, and, and then at this point, I would like to quote that because it's very short. Is that okay, Ray? Yeah. Yes, it is. Okay. <laughs> This is what is inscribed on the statue for Knut Rasmussen. He was a, an Inuit explorer. And, he, and, that, and this is about that. And here goes the Danish. Ene luftens honor kenner, vel jeg møder bag ved fjellet. Men alligevel, jeg kører mine hunde videre og frem. Videre og frem. Videre og frem. And my translation goes like this. Only spirits of the air know what I shall meet behind the mountain. But still I drive my dogs further on, farther on, farther onward. And that, of course, is a tribute to that spirit of exploration into the unknown that poetry also is. Okay, <clears throat> then uh, I have translated the... Uh, a stanza from Hans Christian Andersen's song about Denmark. In Denmark I was born. I Denmark er jeg født, as it's called in Danish. And I have a little introduction about that, but I'll get to that later. In the first section called In Denmark I was born, uh, it really uh, establishes my Danish identity. And uh, it includes uh, uh, a poem about the, the island in the Baltic where my, my father was born. And uh, one of my favorites is about uh, a farmer who uh, sows his seed. I might read that later if we have time. And Dane Graves, about the very old graves, my grandmother's songs. And uh, I even have one about my very, very early infant time. Uh, and uh, then I move on to the second one, which is sort of the core of this, of this collection. It, it is called Every Time Danish Memories. And it consists of, uh, of uh, what, what, what I call American sonnets, except for one short poem. And uh, which means that uh, it's an unrhymed iambic pentameter poems. Uh, and uh, 
uh, it's all about my Danish memories. Then the section, next session is at home in America, about Washington DC, Santa Anita racetrack, et cetera. And uh, uh, my brother, Pierre, who's with us, especially appreciated one in here called our mountain stream because he was part of that. He's part, he's in the poem. <laughs> and uh, then also there's uh, Georgia is involved here uh, because I moved to Georgia with Jeannie. And then finally, I have a section called Hello Again, Farewell, which is a way of summing up, but it's almost all, I think it's all about Denmark or one way or another. And uh, uh, four of these poems were published in the bridge that I mentioned earlier. So that's, that's it. That's the book. <laughs> that's great. So there is a logic to the section in each of the book. So I think it, we're, we're best served if we do another poem from each of you now. Do you oh, have okay. another one, Finn? Well, you requested uh, The Little Mermaid, and uh, I'll, I'll read The Little Mermaid. There it is. Okay, we're sharing screen on it. You can all see it. And uh, Hans Christian Andersen has this line in, in the story of The Little Mermaid. Once you have a human body, you can never become a mermaid again. And there, there's the, uh, obviously, <clears throat> the theme of the lost identity and the gained identity. <clears throat> so this is my poem about the little mermaid. A Japanese shivers under her umbrella. Is this the little mer statue that that world famous mermaid? The one from the tale I read as a child, this bronzy girl splashed by cold water from the swells of passing cruise ships. But she stares at it at, at <coughs> excuse me, but she stares as if at a long lost sister. As her umbrella lifts with a gust from the sea, her wet cheeks send me back to my Danish childhood, mom reading The Little Mermaid, human with fishtail, girl of two worlds. <clears throat> so there you go. You have the <laughs> you have the two identities, the two the two different worlds, and the irrevocable change you of immigration, uh, which is also transformative, of course. So. So that's 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 that. Any questions or comments? I like yeah. how that second stanza starts. You know, the first stanza sets it up, and then right that first line of the second stanza. Of course, I can't see it now, to, uh, but it was nice. But she, yeah, but she stares, she stares as if at a long lost sister. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Ben. I like that uh, so much because it talks so truly about an immigrant, what it's like to have two identities, something lost and something gained and something new. You can never go back to the old world. You're still part of it, but you can never, never, never again uh, become a Danish. You will never feel that 100% home as you did before. I like it a lot. It talks to me. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Helga, do, you, do you have another poem? Uh, yes, I do. Um, I'd like to read this poem that includes uh, so many lives that were lost, and the poem explains itself. Uh, it's called Flesh Flood. It doesn't matter that the sugar maple is leaning closer to the house that the cluster of seeds I planted yesterday will wash away. Something doesn't add up. The dishwasher still leaks after repair. Wrens nest in the window box and the cardinal rules the bird feeder. Another woman gives her unborn to the knife. February is too wet. Each day spiders crochet webs like bridges across the living room windows I have to unravel. 
The mailbox shuts its mouth to good news. The neighbor's cat prowls in use. The flag wraps itself around the pole. Another soldier is ambushed and gunned down. The house creaks and settles ghosts. Weeds shoot up like fences. Rain lakes in the wheelbarrow rusts. We close the garden door, but at night we hear brisk wind shaking its lock. Another parent forgot the baby in the car. Ants squeeze through cracks, trail the kitchen floor. I watch you cut crepe myrtle to stumps, then leaving tiny heaps of dirt on the tile inside. <clears throat> the toaster oven grows crumb-like calluses. The lamp socket hangs loose. Wet cold lies over the woods. Another shooter kills six people. There is nothing we can do. It is a year no different from any other. We sit in front of the fire, rubbing hands together as rain floods and drowns wishes, children and pets. Nothing can bring any of them back. Thank you. <clears throat> wow, Helga, that, that's, that is a tsunami of details that support that poem. That's amazing. Very good, excellent. Thank you. <clears throat> Powerful. Very well presented in a powerful poem, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think everyone's agreeing with that. It's just uh, so many inches. What, what prompted that, Ken? Um, I was reading a poem by Marie Howe, and uh, that got me started, but then I included um, the news that you hear about every day that you read in the paper and uh, that kind of gave the poem the depth that it needed. Thank you. So it goes from one, one little snapshot to the next, just a whole series. Um, yes. And then the last line though about none of them coming back. Yes. Well, you leave us in a very, <laughs> I like poems with happy endings, <laughs> but, yeah, but, but, I, uh, but honestly, that's an essential story. Yeah. But honestly, it's, it's just so powerful just the way it is. Just leave it hanging. Uh, why add a fairy tale ending onto that? Yeah. Okay. The question's already been asked, but uh, let's talk about language a bit. Um, both of you have told me that English has become your primary language. Uh, Helga, do you want to say any further, anything further about that? Um, oh, yes. Well, of course, it takes years and years. I'm still learning, by the way. Um, this is after 50 years of living over here. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I was very impressionable. Um, I was 21 when I came to the United States, but I was very naive, had never traveled, had never studied languages, nothing. So everything American, um, I just swallowed it whole. Um, <laughs> So, but it, it took a while uh, because you do continuously travel between the two languages. Uh, you go back and forth. And, but when I, uh, in my dream, talked to my mother in English, who does not, who did not speak English, then I knew that the language had taken hold in me. Ah. And uh, now in old age, <laughs> <laughs> I keep going back to German and many times when I'm looking for a word, it's the German word that comes first. And that is kind of interesting. Go uh, ahead, I'm done. 
Dan, um, you said you said to me, I think that uh, your English, your your when you speak Danish, it has the infl an inflection that tells people maybe not a, a native speaker. Now wait a minute. What did you just say, Ray? I know what he means. Like so, when you you've talked about before how when you speak in Danish, the inflection isn't quite the same as the native. Yeah. Does that make sense? <laughs> You're, bre You're breaking that. up, Kelly. Oh well, I don't know. <laughs> Okay, well, let me, I'll comment on that. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, okay, let's talk about that. Uh, <clears throat> uh, yes, it's true. And, and I also have this phenomenon in my old age. I mean, I think I'm there <laughs> uh, of uh, Danish word coming to me before the English. And I right here by my study, I have a, a Danish English dictionary that I use once in a while because it just, because it blocks the English, the English word blocks, but uh, that doesn't happen very often. But uh, uh, let me go back to my, when I was learning English when, uh, of course I arrived in the United States when I was 11 years old. And it's probably the ideal time to come to another country and learn another language. Yes. It's pre-adolescent and uh, that's what the psychologists say is the right time to learn another language. Mm -hmm. So I did learn to speak English uh, before we went back to Denmark and I attended high school in Copenhagen. Uh, so I already had a good foundation uh, in English, American English. And that was in California, by the way. So uh, that makes a difference too. More, uh, more of a, a standard American in, uh, in California. Uh, so then uh, I went to uh, college and in the, what's now called Pepperdine University and there I met Jeannie, so there you go. And <laughs> here she is. And we have been together for what? Long time, long, 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 long good time. So, but, but in college, I insisted on speaking English. I did not fraternize with Danes. I considered that a, uh, something that would, that would retard my development of my English language. And I took every opportunity I could to speak publicly even, even in college. So uh, if there was an announcement to be made, I, I did that. And, and uh, so I was almost a fanatic about that. I spoke, I spoke and wrote. I didn't write much on my own, but of course I participated in college classes. So, so uh, uh, there was a period of uh, oh, 10, 15 years, I guess, when I hardly spoke any Danish at all. I did write some letters in Danish and I received letters in Danish, but I was focused on, on the uh, language that uh, the community around me, around me spoke. I did start to write some uh, poetry in, in, uh, in college and I haven't quit, haven't, haven't quit yet. I don't intend to quit. So, so uh, let's see. Was that covered or what? Of course, I went to graduate school, you know, got my PhD in English. And then of course, I, I taught English. And here I was a Dane teaching a foreign language, so to speak. But by then it was certainly my first language. And I certainly had acquired a lot of knowledge about English. And, and I, even, even, even there in graduate school, <clears throat> I thought of myself as a, model speaker of American English. And uh, I think I probably was. So, uh, okay, I'm gonna stop that and- Ben? Any questions? This is Jay. Do you count in Danish or English? Do I what? Count. Oh, count. Hey, Jay. <clears throat> I count 
in English and I dream in English. And uh, uh, however, when I go to Denmark after a few days, I start dreaming in Danish. And uh, so I still have my Danish uh, language identity intact. Yeah. We understand if you learn English before puberty, yeah. you, you tend to keep counting in the native language. But if you learn after, uh, no, the reverse. If you yeah. learn English after puberty, you tend to count in your native language yes. and, and you still retain that no matter how long you're in the United well, let's States. Let's check with Helga. Helga, I, what about that? Yes, I agree to that. When I count, I count in German. Oh, really? Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, uh, yes. Really? I, I count in Danish also. Oh, you do? Well, oh, when yes. did you... Klaus, when did you get here? I came when I was uh, 30 years old. And uh, I think about this uh, speaking um, Danish and English in the dreams. I don't speak any languages in the dreams. There are no languages. I don't remember any language. But the thing about remembering more and more Danish words, I think our short-term memory is getting weaker and our long-term memory getting stronger because like both you and the Helga, my uh, words that I'm looking for sometimes, they come in Danish first and then oh, yeah. English yeah. later on. But I always count in Danish. It's much easier, much faster. It is, yes. <laughs> well, Ulrich, is Ulrich still here with us? Ulrich, Arrow, Arrow, Ross, where are you here? When I play cards, it's in I count uh, uh, the king and queen and all in. In Danish, no, bono, no. Yeah, now I can't even remember <laughs> you asked the question. Yeah. But, uh, well, I don't know what I count in. Uh, so, anyway. <laughs> okay. All right. So, then, then, yeah. yeah. Uh, why don't you relate what happens when you go to Denmark and speak Danish? Yeah, well, uh, Jeannie, of course, is, is with me a lot of the time then. And uh, I speak... I, I start off in sort of tentatively, but in a few days, I gain the, well, my, my old native language back. And then I feel like I'm really a, a Dane in Denmark speaking Danish. But I also know that people in Denmark listen to me and they, they hear a Southern accent, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a Sean Caulfield that had his hand up. Sean, did you have a question? Yes, please. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question for both uh, Finn and Miss Kidder. And I'm wondering when you're thinking in your native language, you're, you're thinking in Danish or German, um, are, there, are there phrases that, that come to mind in, in those languages that you find difficult? to render uh, into English and do those phrases tend to be from a certain domain? Do they, do they belong to um, maybe uh, love or the household or uh, things that are particularly associated with the cultures that you came from as, as young people? Ah, Helga? Oh, I think it's probably more culturally related um, where you can't... Um, quite make the connection to the English because it's something that just wouldn't translate well, you know, if you were to translate it word by word. So uh, that does happen, but for me, um, I, I try not to do that when I write. I, I think mostly in English, yeah. Okay, well, and, and I would say that <clears throat> that my greatest difficulty is when speaking Danish is to render abstractions, you know, uh, wheelbarrow, you know, uh, is, <laughs> is not that hard. It's very, very concrete. Uh, uh, what, what, what in the world is it in Danish? <laughs> I can't think of it. Anyway, uh, so uh, it's the abstractions mostly. And then of course there are some concepts that are difficult to transliterate, as it were, 
in other words, you know, transfer the meaning to another language and make sense. You know, you're all familiar with the, with the Danish word hygge, H-Y-G-G-E. You know, right now it's all over the place over here in America because people are fascinated by it. But uh, uh, it isn't very translatable. So uh, we talk in Danish about a, a uh, uh, companionable and pleasant experience like with a, with a meeting, it hygelig you know, and uh, that kind of thing. Uh, but uh, what is that? Well, it's pleasant, companionable, and uh, uh, what else? I don't know. <laughs> anyway, there's an example. <clears throat> Yeah, thank, thank you, Finn. I, I, I was wondering what that says about a culture that they make room for a term like that or, or they, they lack a term like yeah. that, describing a particular reality that, that we can all experience. Right. Um, I have another answer, too. I tried to write um, in German, poetry in German as well, and uh, because it was suggested to me and it does not work for me. I can only write poetry in English. Um, so I don't know why it, um, when I write in German, it sounds clunky to me. So anyway. Uh, that's, that's pretty much my experience too. I have tried to write uh, some poetry in Danish and uh, uh, there's uh, I guess a little bit of, of my poetic style or something comes through, but it's not it's not very good. Thank you both. Okay, <laughs> I think we're close to an ending point here, but I do think we have time for you each to do one more poem, if you like. Okay. Does that, does that sound suitable? Do one more poem to finish? Yes. For okay. While they're looking, um, uh, someone asked about language. Uh, language, oh, yeah. reflects, language reflects the values and the, uh, of a culture. And what the language leaves out, they, they don't pay any attention to. Uh -huh. So if you study the language and the vocabulary of a language, you will realize the things that are valuable and the things that are not. Um, for instance, I understand Eskimos have 10 different ways of describing snow. Obviously, they have a lot of dealings with snow, which we don't <laughs> need in the Southeast. And so uh, if you study the language, those uh, vocabulary um, does reflect the values. The other interesting thing about language is that uh, each language, as Finn has pointed out, has a special word that in particular resonates. And once you understand the meaning of it, once you learn Spanish or Danish or whatever, you will tend to use that word because the meaning so fits that, that word, mm -hmm. but you yes. can never translate it. And if these two who have studied and are poets and studied words can't find the words, then it's impossible. But it's, it's, a, it's a subjective thing that you learn through exposure. And that's when you get the full meaning. So the tendency for people who know different languages is to, if they both know that language, they will use that particular word in communicating with one another because the meaning is so apt and you can't translate it. So it's it's very interesting. Um, in another life, I might have been a linguistic expert, but it is very interesting. Yes, thank well, you. you. Yeah, well, Jay, you studied some Chinese, haven't you? I studied w one semester in college. <laughs> That's the extent of my study. <laughs> so. Well, so, so let's, let's hear it for language education. And uh, Sean is a language teacher. And, it, and the, the point is that, that you learn different concepts and different cultures and different values, and that you can add them to your own life repertoire 
<laughs> of, of behavior and thinking. And that is the value of learning uh, another language. <clears throat> okay. Now, Did you have what? a poem to share? Do you have something to share in your... Oh, sure. <clears throat> I would like to read the poem that I call Seed uh, from my book. <clears throat> Seed. A man bends down. Off his tractor he bends down. He's plowing the kingdom where the ice came and left scoured rounded stones. A man bends down where his father bent down, where his father's father bent down, his horse blowing steam in the cold spring air off the Baltic, where his father's 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 father bent down, his oxen waiting, loam in the cleft of their hooves, rich dung plopping and steaming. A man bends down, lays hands on a frost heaved stone, caresses its glacier smoothed curve, his hands exploring where soil meets stone. He squats, hefts, lifts, carries, pressing granite to groin, back arched, breath held, face crimsoned. He staggers to the sledge that horse or ox or tractor pulls to clear his alluvial field, to sow his seed, to harvest wheat, to bake his daily bread. Wow. Finn, that, what rich image, I think. Yes. And, and just okay. such a, a picture. Finish. Thank you, that was good. Ah, thank you so very good. much. Okay. Bent down. Bent Any down. questions? That reframe of that mm -hmm. term. I love the way, so this is the second poem I've, I've really noticed it in. First the calling and now the bending. Like this tiny image and you make a whole entire world out of it. Oh, I love that comment. Thank you very much, Kelly. Yeah. Yeah. Like looking at all of human history in one little... Yeah, right. that's, what I, that's right. That's what I tried to do. Can I um, point out, I, I, I snuck a peek at your website while we've been talking, and I looked at your photos, which are just spectacular, and it seems to me they're similar to your poetry, and the point that was <clears> just <throat> made, that you take a small thing that is maybe not particularly spectacular or noticeable to a lot of people, and the way you look at it turns it into something really significant, which you do in both your poetry with these images that we're talking about and in your photography. And if y'all haven't seen his website and the photos, they are really informative, I think, to the way Finn relates to the world. I've always been amazed by that, but today it's kind of a double whammy with poetry and pictures. Thank you, Jim. That's quite, quite nice. I appreciate it. Jim and I have a history together of doing photography. Uh, back when I was in graduate school, we went out and photographed all kinds of stuff. And, and only just the, less than a year ago, we went out and did the same thing. And I, uh, I really appreciate the appreciation. <laughs> so look at, look at my website. I would really like for you to look at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We will. Finnbilly.com. Yeah. Helga, what yes. do you have? Okay, um, I have this poem from uh, my new collection uh, that will be uh, coming to print either in late fall or the first of the year. Uh, that's called Learning Curve. And I used a, um, as the title, a phrase from William Wordsworth the world is too much with us. I don't remember the chain of my ancestry, how I ended up with the round face of a Neanderthal, the red strands of a Goth, the skin of a Roman, and the temper of a Hun. 
<laughs> All these nations in my blood I carried to America. I learned that buttons on your shirt may signal pride, that hate is a common denominator, that guns are toys in your play chest, and the flick of a cigarette builds fires, leaves houses and people and wildlife in ashes. I carry with me half of the world. Some days feel the weight on my shoulders like Atlas. That's why I don't mind that leaves brittle and trees let go, that air plays in bare branches. Thank you. Oh, that's great. Very air, good. Was that last line, air plays in bare branches? In bare branches, yes. Okay. Oh, very good, Helga. That inspires me to write because I just got my DNA analysis back. And uh, I, I, want to, I want to do something with that. Uh, uh, and, and, I, and I think I will. Okay. Good, good. Ray? Ray's having problems with his uh, computer connection a little bit. He oh. asked me to kind of finish some stuff up here. For him, um, I want to thank Ray for all of he's all he's done uh, for this project. I hope you can hear this, Ray. He uh, he did some book reviews and uh, and arranged this meeting and and he's the current president. He's been a long time board member, past president, and current president of the Chattanooga Writers Guild. So I I really appreciate what he's done to make this. And also, I should mention that. Uh, both Finn and Helga did a great interview with Richard Wim and Winham on our local radio station, WUTC. And we can post a link to that because they have it archived. But they really had a good discussion on the radio about immigration and the books. And, uh, but let's see. I'm for yeah. Helga. Mark. What, what, yes. On that poem you just read, was there anything else? Was that part of the book? Someone asked, where that, can they? That is the new book. It is not out yet. I'm sorry. Uh, it's it was just to whet your appetite for my next book. <laughs> okay. Well, now would um, be a good time to tell, because we've talked about loving the dead, but tell us about your new book before we go. Well, it deals with uh, language, uh, perhaps similar to what Finn has been doing, but um, in, a, in a different way, um, I'm talking how language, how it um, flows into you and what you do with it and what it feels like. And um, also uh, how you, how I incorporated culture, the different cultures, <clears throat> And so there are some memory poems and, um, uh, oh Lord, it's just full <laughs> of good stuff. <laughs> and but, we um, don't... <laughs> from Blue Light Press again, and it will be on Amazon. Yes. Just... Um, right. I, I have a question, Mark. Uh, can you send me a link to this particular interview so I can pass it on to people who could not... Uh, be here? Yes. What For everyone here, uh, we're recording this and it will be uh, it will be posted on the website of the Chattanooga Writers Guild under it's uh, the tab called resources and videos and we will post the link then uh, on the Facebook page and I will send it to uh, Finn and Helga and they can pass it on to whoever they want. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. I, I have cha saved chat as a file, and I will send that to each of them. Oops. Were you going to say something, Kelly? Oh, I was just... I, was, I went ahead and typed it in the chat. Thank you both, Finn and Helga. I've really enjoyed this. Um, and really cool in insights with the interactions too from the audience about language and culture. I learned some things. 
<laughs> Great. Good to have okay. you here, Kelly. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, how about if I stop the recording now for done? Ray, do you have anything else to say before I stop the recording? Okay. I wanted to thank thank everyone and the Chattanooga Writers Guild for hosting this, and uh, we've just had a great time. And I'll stop the recording, and then you're welcome to.